Hello and welcome to this bonus episode of Statistically Insignificant. Thank you for your money, in fact. My name is Tess, my pronouns are she, they, and I'm here trying to run a tabletop adventure for the biggest clowns in the world. Playing a bard that somehow got his hands on the universe's only harmonica, it's Bart. How's it going, Bart? I'm going well, and actually if this was real life I'd probably be reading a book in the corner. And like... <laughs> Please, you'd be a bard. I'm sure we could bully you into playing a bard. If you don't want to play a bard, we always need a cleric, right? That's as traditional. Playing the most goblin of goblins, it's Dean of the show, Dean, my partner. Uh, hello? You're not going to do the voice? <laughs> I don't know. What, what are you referring to? Fucking blank tick. No, I, I don't I know this person. <laughs> He's lying. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not familiar with this character who I can't stop playing. <laughs> I've managed to stop speaking in the goblin voice. For nearly two weeks straight, and now you want to relapse me um, <laughs> in front of however many people listen to your bonus episodes. <laughs> One is too many. One is too All many. four people. <laughs> no, no, the bonus episode. We have three people on the Patreon at the moment, <laughs> and I don't think the bonus episodes get listened to by any of them. All right, well, perfect. In that case, I'm, I'm free to do the Goblin at some point. Oh, yeah, you're just going to sneak up on me I'll with it. I'll sneak up with you with it. Okay. Uh, before we begin, actually, I'd like to propose, Bart, that we form a union uh, to protest my working conditions, where I am on a horrible jerry-rigged mobile phone setup, uh, listening on a muted... I, we have two perfectly good studio-quality microphones in this room. Yeah, but he... No, 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 no. I offered to help you set up your studio-quality microphone not in this room. AKA away from my computer. Yes. That is not... See, this is... This we'll is the kind of compromise the that... This is the kind of compromise that union-busting overlords <laughs> like yourself use to uh, keep the boot... On good, honest, hardworking podcasters. Well, I always, uh, I always uh, believed in an injury to one is an injury for all. But I don't know. This the, a union might not be right for this business. Uh, we might. Uh... Well, look. All I'm going to say on that front <laughs> is that uh, <laughs> Dean, Dean is a a current... <laughs> <laughs> Dean is the unpaid labour. And because you're a guest, you're not getting paid for this. That's true. I'm contracting. I now mean, you're engaging contract labor as well. Bart and I aren't getting paid for this either because the Patreon money isn't enough to pay for the, the hosting costs yet. We should all unionize against <laughs> your listeners. <laughs> okay. okay. Hmm. We will withhold the podcast. <laughs> until, until I mean, we kind of do already because we withhold the bonus episodes unless I can't we be asked doing a free episode. You, they need to come to the table. To yeah, negotiate. yeah, exactly. Yeah. Anyway, I always sorry. considered this podcast a bit of a people's war against our listeners. <laughs> Critical support for statistically insignificant. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so today we're going to be talking about the probability structures that show up in tabletop games. These range from the very straightforward to the annoyingly complex. And as we will see, the gap between those is probably smaller than you think. So our very first example is going to be looking at a single die with some bonus. So your typical uh, 1, D, N, plus K. So N is the size of the die. K is the bonus. So this might be something like you're rolling for damage and you have a 1, D, 10, plus 5. Or you're rolling to hit and you have a 1, D, 20, plus 3. Are we just assuming that anyone listening to this podcast is nerdy enough to sort of understand oh, fuck yeah, the we context? Are. Okay, fantastic. We yeah, have yeah. to lay the groundwork. Yeah, yeah. So this is a dice with N sides and you're adding some number to the outcome. Okay, just because I don't play these games, you have different sized dice per roll, right? It depends on what you're doing. Yeah, yeah. So your typical six-sided dice die would be a 1d6, yeah. which has kind of an invisible plus zero over here. So this is the numbers 1 to 6. Mm -hmm. If you have a 1d10, that's the numbers 1 to 10. I think Bart was more trying to get at sort of what you use the different dice for. Ah, well, that depends on the particular tabletop game. We're going to have some specific examples, but I'm going to be talking in general about dice because the, the way that they are used across different games is so hugely variable. Yeah. Most of them, Bart, use a d20 for sort of your general uh, attempt to do a thing, like tackle a goblin, swing a sword, etc. Sure. Because 1 to 20 is enough of a range of, of probability that... Um, you have a nice spread. Yeah. And uh, it's not so big. Some places do use the D100, but honestly, fuck them. Why? <laughs> There's too many numbers. I can't count that high. I think that they use that mostly because it's easy in your head to convert to percentage. Okay. I was about to say D20 is easy to convert to percentage. That's not true. I've just had a lot of practice from playing this stupid You numbers. have, yes. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I have played uh, Disco Elysium, so I guess that's the vibe I'm kind of Yeah, so that. that's a D20 system. And you uh, get D12, both. actually. D12. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's 1D12, and you get yeah. a bonus. Mm -hmm. The minimum you can get is 1 plus the bonus. 
Yeah. The distribution that we use for this is called the uniform distribution. Uh, uniform because the probability of each value is nominally the same on a fair die. Yeah, nominally, I'd say, is the key <laughs> yeah. phrase yeah. there. Because some die are cursed. That's true. Are we talking about the cursed die? This. Oh, we are absolutely talking okay, about fantastic. cursed dice. Yeah, yeah. I want to find out how to stop it. Presumably, you know. I'm sorry. I, I'm not into that kind of maths. <sighs> <laughs> right, well, let's go to find out whatever the fucking course of work that is, and I'm signing <laughs> Look, the people who are really into black magic and mathematicians are the ones who do integration theory. Are they? Okay, well, I'm finding them and I'm beating them up. <laughs> <laughs> I would recommend going and seeing your local priest, Dean. <laughs> <laughs> just turning up with a whole bunch of dice. Just <laughs> yeah, yeah. holy water spit on these, something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So we usually use the minimum value for the dice as one parameter, which in this case will be this uh, one plus the bonus, and the max value, that's an X, I promise, as the other parameter, which is the uh, size of the die, so N plus the bonus. So the max value on your 1D6 plus 0 is 6, right? Because that's the highest value. The minimum is 1. Mm -hmm. uh, if you have 1D12 and you do, like, plus 5, your minimum is going to be 1 plus 5, which is 6, and your max is going to be 12 plus 5, which is 17. And that's why great swords, which deal 2d6 damage, are better than battle axes that deal 1d12. We are not getting to 2d6 just yet. Okay, is that too complicated? It's too complicated for this bit. Okay, sorry. I'm sorry, listener. You, you have jumped ahead. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm jumping back. Aside from looking at the specific value on the die, which is uniformly distributed, you can look at a kind of success fail based on a threshold. So if you have your classic 1d20 and you've got a plus 5 to hit, and you need to get, say, 22 in order to actually hit the goblin, what you have is no longer kind of a uniform distribution of the values. You have success, which looks like uh, 22, 23, 24, or 25, which is four of the 20 possibilities, or a failure, which is the rest. And has a probability of 16 on 20. Shouldn't you write that as little um, beak pointing towards? <laughs> oh, oh, okay. 20. So greater than, so this should be greater than or equal to 22. That's it, the little beak. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So... <laughs> <laughs> what? No, no, I 100% agree. But I have, shall we say, ongoing conflict with the general notation that's used in tabletop games, which we'll get to. Well, I certainly I've never seen it written like this. See, you're taking the fun of it. You're taking the magic out of it. <laughs> you sure. call it a beak. I always imagined it was like crocodile jaws. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's true. Well, it's the same concept. The Something, crocodile yeah. eats the bigger number. <laughs> Something acquisitive, greedy, etc., etc. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. So in this context, your probability of a success is one on five, and your probability of a failure is four on five. Five. And you can do this for any kind of success fail on an individual die. We're going to talk about dice pools in just a second, because in general, more dice means more problems. Now we're going to look at your 2d6. Oh, you don't, I don't want to, she's drawn something on a piece of paper here and it's arcane. This is not good. <laughs> oh, you have slides? Yeah, what the f Oh my god. I thought you just drew. This is even nerdier than I thought, and I came onto a podcast about tabletop games. You fool, you rube. <laughs> I'm going to write this as uh, N, sorry, as KDN, right? So that is K dice. Kill death numpty. Of size <laughs> N. We're not going to worry about plus a bonus for this because fuck that, it's too annoying. If you have just one, you get a uniform distribution for the total, for the actual value, right? If you have more than one, you no longer have an, a, a uniform distribution for the total value. So as an example, let's look at first 1d3. So the possible values, which we'll call x, are 1, 2, or 3. The probability of getting a value, because it's uniform, it's the same, is a third, right? You've got three possible values, they all have the same. It's a third probability of each. What the fuck are you talking about, Jesse? What? <laughs> the probability of rolling a 1 on a 1d3 is a third. Okay, yeah. The probability of rolling a 2 is a third. All right, yes. The probability of rolling a three. Yeah, I follow. I can see a pattern emerging. Yep, they have all <laughs> the same probabilities. I thought you were talking about multiple dice. I am now talking about multiple dice. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> so what's the lowest possible value you can get on 2d3? Two. Yep. So you can get x equal to two. You can get three, four, five, or six. Wait, what is, what is x here? x is the total 
number if you add up the values on the die. In this case, you just... Oh, so X can only be one of those five outcomes? Yes. Uh, okay, I'm, I'm with you, yes. Okay, so let's have a look at the possible you combos. see what I have to put up with here? <laughs> we definitely need a union. If <laughs> so what combos gives us a two? One on one. Yep. What I'm being com- aggressive, like I'm, like I'm going to be caught out. This is how I did mathematics. In I know. <laughs> what combos give us a three? Uh, one and two, and two and one. Yes. Ah, see, I remember. Uh-huh. You what, proud of me, Mr. Bond? What He's combos not. give us a four? One, two and two, three, two and two. <laughs> yeah, two, but two. you can do the other one. <laughs> two, two, one, three, three, one. How about a five? Uh, why don't? Why is it two, two there a second time? That's a unique combination. Oh no! One of them's on the blue dice. One of them's on the red one with speckles. Okay, but if you roll two on the blue and two on the red, that's the same as rolling two on the red and two on the blue. No, no, no. One of them's on the left side when I do it one time, and then the next time I roll it, the red one's on the left side. Okay, but that's a different roll. We're looking at the possible outcomes of a single roll. I don't know why I fucking bother. <laughs> well, how, what combos give you a five? Uh, Bart, take this one. I'm dead. <laughs> one and four. Two you and three. You can't get a four into a 1d3. So it's two and three. Oh, of course. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and three, two. Three, two. And then what combos give you a six? Well, it'd be three, three. Yep. I like how we both knew the answer, but uh, it's, it's, it's got to be a trick question. I'm not. <laughs> this is this is. I'm not trying to trick you. I promise. You're, too, you're talking about probability. Okay. You're trying to trick so us. here, right? We have nine possible outcomes, right? Okay. Represented by each of these combinations of numbers. Mm-hmm. One of the nine gives us a two. Two of the nine gives us three. Three of the nine give us four. Oh. Two of the nine give us five. And one of the nine gives us six. Right. And if you simplify that, it's a, you have a one-third chance of getting a four. Yeah. So the probability of getting each of those outcomes corresponds to the number of outcomes that give that result. Mm-hmm. This certainly is interesting. These are not the same. This is no longer a uniform distribution. Oh, I hate learning what new things mean. <laughs> <laughs> I have to say, Bart, this is actually going to be very helpful. I don't... I don't think I've ever told you, but I'm actually trying to make my own tabletop game. And doing that without knowing any of this, it makes it very difficult. Yeah, I've been I trying imagine, really. to fucking let him teach me this for <laughs> years. Let you teach me. The- I've been just been staring. I've just been rolling the same handful of dice for like six hours at a time, staring at it going, I don't fucking know. That's- <laughs> it's not a great rule set, frankly. It's... Oh, well, you see, I did something equivalent, which is I got my computer to simulate dice to demonstrate this for uh, D6. Here is what you get with 1d6, right? Hell yeah. I've done 100,000 dice rolls. Right? That's only says 15,000. 15, yeah, because each column represents the number of results that got one. Oh, oh they're actually different. Did you, you, you didn't actually do this. You just made this up. No, I, I literally, sim- I can show you right here the code that I oh. used to do this. You made yourself homework? <laughs> I run a podcast. <laughs> That's it freak. doesn't count as homework because now I'm the one teaching these subjects. Carry on, but this is freak shit. <laughs> <laughs> so, of 100,000 rolls, you see roughly the same number fell into each of these totals, right? Yeah. So this is 1d6. It's not quite the same because these are simulated and you'll always see a little bit of variation. Or, sorry, I actually rolled these, I guess, is the way to think about that. Here is 2d6. Uh-huh, yep. So you can see that same kind of triangle shape also, notice that we have the lowest possible value is 2, mm-hmm. highest possible value is 12, whereas on this one, the lowest possible value is 1, and the highest possible value is 6. So we're looking at different distributions here. Yeah, and like I was saying, this is the, the greatsword thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The battle axe can get a 1, the greatsword, minimum of 2, you're more likely to get a 7, as opposed to equally distributed between the yes, but like the 6 and the 7, etc. Here's 3d6. Oh, oh. no. <laughs> Yeah, it's yeah. becoming that that shape uh-huh. that I'm always on the wrong side of on test results. <laughs> <laughs> We're not eugenicists here. Here's 4d6. It wasn't the test I was referring to. But <laughs> that's where you think I was going with that. <laughs> Here's 5d6. Hang on, stop. Yes. Why is 17 more than 18? It doesn't neatly do the thing. Yeah, this is because these are simulated, not like theoretical results. So because in my simulation... Uh, because like the simulation is the equivalent of rolling five d six a hundred thousand times, right? Okay. Which is never going to be exactly the same as the theoretical result. I think that's two games of Warhammer. 
<laughs> for us to quantify that. Yeah, yeah, roughly. Yeah, t- two average games of Warhammer. Yeah. yeah, basically. I didn't know Warhammer it- had all the dice roll shit. <laughs> oh, yeah, we're going to get to dice pool. The ki- We're going to get the. That's a slightly different structure because in Warhammer, you don't necessarily look at the total sum of the values, which is what we're looking at here. You look at how many of them are above a threshold, right. which is yeah. a different structure again. Which we'll like get if to. my guys shoot your guys. And they have we'll get five to that. bullets. No, yeah. Yeah, this is spoilers. <laughs> oh, sorry. This is spoilers. Stop. Okay. I have very limited expertise in this realm. I'm very eager to show <laughs> <laughs> So this is six of them. Uh, and you can see that we've gone from uniform distribution to something that does, in fact, look like a bell curve. This is what's known as the central limit theorem. So in general, what you're getting at is you have results that are clustered around the average value, which for this is 21, and you get rarer results at the extremes, right? Six being the absolute minimum, 36 being the absolute maximum. As a further demonstration, and I wouldn't pay much attention to the x-axis because it gets hard to read, here is what 10d6 looks like. Here is what 100d6 looks like. You can see that this gets noisy precisely because this is like rolling the dice and looking at the answer. It's not going to perfectly match the curve that it would in theory. What I'm learning there is that whatever that number is, can you move the little mouse so we can see the one perking up? No, go, go ahead, one. This yeah, one? That little, whatever that number is, that's the one you want to be aiming for. <laughs> <laughs> that's the one that's going to score the best. Now, you said a word there that um, piqued my interest, which is a theorem. Yes. Does this imply that there might be some set of dice for which this is not true? No. So this is a, a theorem in the mathematical sense, not a theorem in the scientific sense. So because maths is not a science which means that maths does not provide the best explanation of evidence right as as a like a, a system of knowledge a theorem in in maths is something that is always true if its assumptions are true a theorem in science is the best explanation we have of the current evidence her expression for those who can't see which is everyone except for me is clearly saying you Dull it, you know. No, that is <laughs> not my expression. <laughs> I, I, okay, this is something that I have to talk to scientists and mathematicians about a lot. For which your expression would say, you dull it, you've told you more. <laughs> anyway, please, please continue. I'm sorry for holding this up. <laughs> oh no, you're talking on the podcast where I have you on to talk. Tragic. Really. Oh, no. well, I, I certainly am. So oh. the other thing to notice on this is that the mean of the totals... So the mean that you see when we're looking at the totals for some number is actually equal to the uh, total of the means. So what I mean by that is if I have the mean of 100 D6, that is equal to 100 times the mean of a 1 D6. Which but have you made the joke where she's talking about means and she used the word mean like I mean? I'm not going for it. Yet? He hasn't been that cruel. Thanks. <laughs> sorry, what, sorry, I, sorry, I'm going to do it now. Ready? Here comes the joke. Sorry, what did you mean? Ah! Ah, ah, ah. Oh. Now I'm giving you the look. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, please. So this becomes 100 times uh, 3.5. Spoilers, the, the average on a 1d6 is 3.5. So that is 350. Okay. You can use this calculation for any of these. So the average on your 6d6 is 6 times the average or the mean of 1d6. Hey, 21. Yeah. I was not at all confident making that proclamation, so I'm very happy that worked out. <laughs> <laughs> well, think about it like this, right? 6 times 3 is 18. That's, that's, that's how I got there. Yeah, yeah. Just because I know how to do it doesn't mean I'm in at all confident in the answer. That's me in maths, to be perfectly honest. <sighs> yeah, sorry. I don't even have my time tables memorized, so it would take me slightly longer to do it in the first place. Look, I'm going to be honest. <laughs> uh, I have some of the time tables memorized. <laughs> in general, I believe that computers are built to do arithmetic for me, so I don't do it myself. I know 12 times 12 is 144, and that's... <laughs> you were hesitated there. I really did. I'm about to say why I'm about to fuck myself. <laughs> but that's about the only one I've got on lock. Yeah, yeah. Now we can talk about the dice pools. My mother hung a uh, a chart of the times tables on the back of the toilet door for me, mm-hmm. um, which she hoped would uh, engender in me the ability to do them by g- giving me a great deal of time to think about it. What it actually means is that whenever I think of the times tables, I now want to shit. <laughs> <laughs> Pavlov would be so proud. Mm. 
So what these look like is that you have some number of dice that you throw, and then a dice is a success if it passes a particular threshold. So Warhammer does this, for example. Oh, can I explain it now? Oh, go on. Okay, so Bart, I've got like five guys, and they each have one like shot. Yeah. Some guns have many, many shots. So that gives me a dice, a pool of five dice. You can think of them like the five bullets. Yep. I roll them, and depending on my guy's ability to shoot versus if you guys are, your guys are in cover or whatever, I have to roll above a certain threshold to say, do those bullets connect? So rather than it being about the total, each individual dice is representing an event. Right. So we don't really care about the value on the dice so much as whether it's a success or a fail. So we're going to look at two hit and two wound. Yeah, and so in, in Warhammer, I get to explain the next bit. <laughs> so let's say my bullets hit your guys. Now we say, do they go through your guy's armor? And so those bullets, let's say three out of the five hit, I would then roll those three again, or three dice representing those initial three, and they would have to roll above another threshold to indicate dealing enough damage to represent a threat. Yeah. Each of these is defined by the number of dice and the probability of success. And what success looks like varies from one roll to the next. So let's say on to hit, you have to get a five plus, and this is where my notational issues come into play, uh -huh. which means greater than or equal to five, so five or six on a 1d6. Uh, we'll say this is 1d6, and then again 1d6 to wound, let's say it wounds on a three plus, which means greater than or equal to three, so that's three, four, five, or six. Five or six is a third probability because it's three of the six possibilities. Three uh, greater than or equal to three is two thirds because it's four of the six. And if you add those two together, it's three thirds, which means every single one of them will wound. Yeah, it's like an Israeli sniper. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know they shoot to wound. <laughs> so let's imagine we have 30 d6, right, in this situation. We hit on a five plus, we wound on a three plus afterwards. Our first roll to hit, uh, the number of dice is 30, the probability of success is a third. The average number of hits, the mean number of hits. What do you mean by that? <laughs> the average. Is it still funny? No. Okay. So you don't have to try again. Maybe ne maybe next time, maybe next time. But you, you try next episode and see how it works out. Uh, I'll, I'll give it a crack. Thanks. I'm uh, encouraged by the success rate it's had so far. <laughs> well, it might, it might have a one third success rate, huh? <laughs> huh? Now she's giving me the look for sure. <laughs> <laughs> So how you get this is it's what we call a binomial distribution, which looks at the number of successes from some number of trials, which in our case is the number of dice, where you have the same probability of success for each one. The mean number here is going to be n times p, which is going to be 30 times a third. That's a, that's a three. Nah, let's try that again. Which is 10. So the average number of hits from my pool of 30 shots is 10. The mean number of wounds gets a little bit more complicated because now the number of dice is based on having succeeded to hit. So what we do here is we take the mean hits and we multiply it by the probability of getting a wound. So this gets 10, which is the mean number of hits, times two thirds, which is the probability of getting a success in a wound, which gives you 6.6666 and so on. Right, six repeater. Are wounds the same no matter the distribution? What do you mean? Would you have... See, now she's doing... See, it is... That was funny. That was good. <laughs> you didn't laugh, though. So. Oh, I was laughing internally. Uh -huh. <laughs> really splitting your ribs, I'm sure. As in, would you have, like, <laughs> like heavier or lighter wounds, depending on what you rolled, I guess, is... Tess is looking at me, and I'm thinking some models or abilities do do a special kind of wound called a mortal wound, and sometimes that is contingent upon the number that you rolled, right. yes. Okay, so like if you rolled a six, that would be a mortal wound or something. Yeah, if that was the rule for that particular... Yeah, model. so that behaves a bit like critical hits yeah. in other sorts of settings, where if you roll a particular value above a threshold, you get a particular result. Are there dice like operating at the back of like Pokemon games? Is that is that what I'm led to believe here? They use RNG to determine some of the outcomes of moves and things. <laughs> yeah, so uh, instead of actually rolling a physical die or a virtual die in the sense of getting an outcome from one to six... If you have this threshold, so you know that the probability of success on a particular one is a third, you can just generate success fail outcomes where yeah, right. success is a probability of a third. I guess it, it's kind of a question of, are you doing it on a computer where you could do it more directly, or are you doing it with physical dice, in which case you would do something like this? And a bunch yeah. of games are designed to like enforce a particular distribution. They don't allow for huge outliers and spikes. I know that 
something called the programmed random occurrence or proc is like something where the, the game is designed to spit out a very clean distribution of, of occurrences over the course of a of a few minutes like in world of warcraft it's not they don't leave that shit up to chance <laughs> yeah fair <laughs> uh, what about all, in all those like old uh, like rpg maker games is would there be a similar kind of like dynamics operating in the background of those uh depending on the age it's it's generally easier to use a simple distribution like well si- relatively simple by which i mean the probabilities are all constant or something like that than it is to try and fuck around with changing the probabilities based on the outcome yeah right let's just say that um pokey machine manufacturers so the the people who build like gambling machines for casinos and shit love to hire stat students because they are extremely careful with the distributions in those things so that they guarantee about a 2% profit. Hell yeah. Could you maybe hurt me a little? And what would it look like if we drew up, like, and we include re-rolls? So this whole process, but then we include on a six, it automatically wounds. But because you're next to a chapter master, uh, you're re-rolling I will not. ones. What does that look like? Because it looks fucking annoying is the answer. Okay, right? well, so, I'm well, glad okay. to have that confirmed for me at least. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, you can think of this as this is the expected number of wounds. Okay. Right? If you have some sort of adjustment to that, so like on a six, you get a like automatic kill shot, let's say. Well, it, I'm specifically thinking that if you roll a six to hit, you skip the wound thing. If you have an auto hit, so you skip this, then your main number of hits would still be ten, but you would expect a sixth of those to not have to do this wound step. Right, okay. Because yes. one sixth of the, those, you expect to roll a six. Uh huh, uh huh. Okay, yep. Yeah, right. Uh, no, that's wrong. Sorry, it's not one sixth of the ten because you know that the ten is already a five or a six. It'd be half of them. Ooh. Yeah, so uh, five of the ten you expect to be automatic hits, and then five you have to go on to do this. So what you would do then is you would get main hits is ten, main sixes is five right so that means down here instead of 10 times two thirds you would have five times two thirds which would be half of that so that'd be 3.3 uh this so you would get five from here plus 3.3 which gives you 8.3 as the average of the mean wounds which is i mean almost two higher yeah one in a a third more all right neat thank you yeah yep <laughs> I'm, st- I'm just struggling to stop myself making the mean joke again <laughs> I'm, I'm white knuckling i mean you you've got to like uh you've got to commit now you've got to mm-hmm. uh, keep going with it <laughs> no, yeah, yeah. I've got to, i think the comedic rule now is i need to wait a while to have a comeback when people least expect it hey what do you mean <laughs> that was very predictable i'm sorry awesome. yeah. all right well Look, I'm, I'm new to podcasting. We're going to try some new techniques. <laughs> so other questions I get asked are things like, what's the probability of no hits? 100% if it's critical. If it's you playing. If it's really important, then it's 100% probability. Dean rolls this. worse than most people I've met. See, <laughs> I, I stand by it. There, there are curses. What's the notation for a fucking curse? Again, go see the priest. <laughs> okay, he knows. <laughs> So how you get this is you can think of this in two ways. The way that I generally think of it is you just look at the probability of a failure on each individual one and each individual roll, and you have to have all of them getting the failure. So this winds up being probability of failure multiplied by itself by the times you are trying. So 30 in our case. Actually, I'll call that N. So for our um, 30D6, right? The probability of a failure, if it's a 5 plus to hit, well, we have two-thirds probability of a failure to hit. So P fail equals two-thirds. And then you raise that to N is equal to 30, right? So you get two-thirds times itself 30 times, which is equal to approximately 0.0000052. So that's five zeros before you get to a five. That's great. I want to know that she didn't work that out on the fly. She had that written down. She's cheated there. I don't do arithmetic raw. I, I just don't want people to accidentally... I don't raw dog arithmetic. This right. is what computers are for. Noted. I'm not doing this shit myself. Fuck that. So you can work this out 
as being pretty small, right? Uh, so 1% would look like 0.01. So this is a lot smaller than 1% of the time. Are you going to get no hits on 30? If you have your five guys, so this would be five, so 5d6, five mm -hmm. the probability of getting no hits would be two on three to the five, which is bigger than that. I'm not, I haven't done this. Hang on, hang on, hang on. I'm going to do this. Watch me pull up my calculator. You should put that on the screen so people can see. Yeah, right. Here is Wolf, Wolf from Alpha, which is what I use to do this sort of thing. So we go two on three to the five, which gives you, yeah, so 13%. Huh. So this is equal to... Much more accurate than my uh, exploration of Wolfram Beta. <laughs> which is approximately 13, right? So 13% of the time, your five guys are just going to miss entirely. Or 100% of the time. It seems to me to be the same thing. Can I take a little digression here? Which is that the human brain, very good at pattern seeking. Yeah. Now, obviously, I've been making comments to curse dice and whatnot. It really does seem that, that there are, I mean, the brain forms narratives out of sort of the, the noise and statistical and whatnot. Dice don't seem to behave in the ways that you're describing. You are looking at a very, very small sample size. I've played a lot. <laughs> yeah, but okay. So for a given die, right, you've probably rolled that a couple of hundred times. Yeah? No. I, I promise you this is actually the case. If you look at what you've actually done... No, please don't ask me to look at what I've actually done. <laughs> <laughs> well, all right. So let's go and have a look at this, right? You see how this is noisy? Yes. Now imagine that one of these ones that is lower, like this one, lower mm -hmm. or lower than what you would expect, right? That's you rolling crits. But or what, on the other side of the spectrum, sure. But what I'm, what I'm saying is that the spikes that my brain perceives, and again, I know that... It, 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 sorry, it's really narrative. a cognitive bias. <laughs> Why human brain do this? <laughs> because human brain evolved to pay particular attention to results, to things that are a threat or a great success. Mm. Threat because it could kill you, great success because you want to replicate it. So that means that you are naturally inclined, and I don't like using the term, but let's call it that, to pay more attention to, rem to and remember more the great successes and the spectacular failures. Right. Well, you know, like um, early in the cycle of iPods, they had make the randomizer button less random because <laughs> yes, people yeah, yeah, kept yeah. like because uh... it was actually random, <laughs> yeah, and yeah. not like <laughs> slightly adjacent random. Yeah. Uh, if you ever want uh, to get Tess going, ask her how annoyed she is by the Thanos snap. Oh my fucking god! And how uh, <laughs> the people were, all of the different Avengers were um, evaporated. She's not really happy with the with the random distribution of how um, the giant purple spaceman <laughs> vanished the various animal-themed pajama people. <laughs> Look, all I'm saying is he clearly has no fucking idea how population dynamics work. Avengers Endgame was one of the worst times I've ever had in the cinema, and I don't know any <laughs> of that shit, so... <laughs> Just now imagining sort of Tess walking up to Thanos with a, with a pen and paper being like, oh, fucker, you cunt! <laughs> you know, giving him the dolt look he is not the genius he thought he was let's put it that way also it's an entire universe how could there not be enough resources the problem with resources on earth is that there's one planet <laughs> well i mean okay you want you, you gotta get me started with this let's fucking go yeah. all right so <laughs> oh, <laughs> 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 Look, all, I, all I'm going to say on this, right, is that if you have the the option to control the universe to such an extent, why the fuck would you not just make it more energy, like, fre <laughs> like energy rich? Yeah, yeah. If that's what you really try to do, just make it more energy rich. I was more referring to your beef with how you perceived that it was uh, not random at all who was vanishing and who wasn't. I mean, I also have beef with that, yes, but yeah. like... At least in the <laughs> Avengers team, though, that makes sense, though, right? You want to take out the competition. But that's... The, anyway, yeah. Neat, neatly 50% of a, of, a, of a highlight. I'm not even... I, look, I'm not even the, the probability freak. <laughs> <laughs> you are, just not in my way of being a probability freak. Precisely. But I, and even I take issue with how that works. That, if Thanos was shooting uh, a space marine bolter, at the Avengers squad, he couldn't get those kind of results. Just, <laughs> the dice just don't align in this one. Yeah. So you can think of this kind of a situation of looking at, like, the number of wounds that you get out of a given dice pool in kind of two different ways. First way is that you have two binomial distributions. Hey, when did binomials come into this? So this is the distribution of the number of successes. So on the first lot, the number of hits. On the second lot, the number of wounds. We use what's called a binomial distribution for that. By gnome meal. 
Okay, so two numbers. What are the two numbers? It comes from a different source of the word. I'm sorry. <sighs> yeah. All right, continue. It comes from what's called the binomial theorem, which I'm not going to talk about. Well, that, in that case, I, I am lost. Sorry, but I'm happy to sit here and listen. It's just the name of the thing. You don't need to care about it other than that it's the name of the thing. Okay, it's the name of the thing. Yeah. I know you're new to the game, Dean, so I will give you the advice that Sometimes you just like let something slide. <laughs> I just just wanted to to find out what the words mean. Yeah, unfortunately, the etymology of this is not so straightforward. All right, I'll well, yep. carry on. Yeah, the first one is to hit is a success. The second one is to wound, uh, and you have one feeding into the other with the successes. Right, the other way is a single binomial distribution where a success looks like hit then wound. So the probability of success turns out to be the probability of a hit times the probability of a wound. Isn't right. that the same thing as the first one? Mathematically, they are equivalent, but people who play games tend to think of it like this. Right. Because okay. you're doing two different roles. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But yeah, the maths does not care. I think the game cares a little. The game like, cares. The maths Because you, you can respond to what the hit dice are, and then like you have little tricks you can play to manipulate the, the goings-on. Like you can, you can re-roll based on what you see. Yeah, but that's... We're not looking at the cases where you have rerolls. All right, well, go, go for your life then. Have fun. Yeah. Now we're going to look at failures. This section I have subtitled The Curse of Blood Bowl because uh, Blood Bowl is like a tangential game to Warhammer and is notoriously punishing. Everybody thinks that they have a really high failure rate in Blood Bowl. So it's like Bloodborne. <laughs> <laughs> so you can look at negative outcomes the same way as you look to positive outcomes, right? A hit, a successful hit is just an outcome that you are interested in, while a critical failure to do something or a failure to do something is also an outcome that you are interested in. It's just not a success in the way you interpret it. So in the case of like your Dungeons and Dragons critical fail, uh, this is when something goes horribly wrong and you, I don't know, like shoot your mate in the back. This usually happens on a 1d20, you roll a 1. Yes. Yep. So this has probability uh, 1 of the 20 outcomes, which is uh, 1 on 20, or 5%. You also have a crit success, which is you roll a 20 on the 1d20. In Blood Bowl, the worst possible outcome usually kills one of your own models, because why not? It's, it's a soccer game. game where everybody dies. Now how that works is that you roll two six-sided dice. Uh, in this case, the number the sides aren't numbered, but one of they have like little symbols on them. One of the symbols is a skull. So if you roll two six-sided dice and get two skulls, that is bad. So that's a bad outcome has happened. You then do that again. Is only one of the faces a skull? I never played Blood Bowl. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. When so did you play Blood Bowl? Blood Bowl. I have never played Blood Bowl, but I have watched people play Blood Bowl. Oh, oh, fair enough. Yeah. You then roll again, and if you get two skulls again. You die. This represents like your goblin walking forward to pick up the ball and just falling over and breaking his neck. Yes. Okay. So we can look at this the same way, right? Uh, so if you roll your two-sided, we'll call this 1d6, so you roll uh, 2d6, and this is the equivalent of looking at, say, two ones, because uh, you have a one on a single side of the die, just as you have a skull on the single side of a die, mm. right? Mm. So this has probability two skulls is equal to probability of a 1 squared, which is 1 sixth, because you multiply them, right? Squared, which is 1 on 36. That's pretty small. Yeah, not not um, relatable to real life football, but surprisingly accurate to the survival rate of Qatari migrant workers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you do this twice, you are rolling 4d6, and you're looking at getting 4 ones, which is probability of getting a 1 to the 4, which is 1 on 1,296. That's a small number. Certainly. If you listen to Blood Bowl players, this happens approximately 50% of the time. <laughs> and, and who are we to question their lived experience? Exactly, yes. That's my response there. As a sociologist, yeah. So hang on. 46, the 1, 2, 9, 6. But getting two skulls twice in a row is only 1 in 36. No. So this is for a single roll. You get 1 in 36, which is 1 t on 6 squared. Right, okay. If you do this twice, it's 1 on th uh, 6 s to the 4th power. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you have a section on this on why, um, when I'm playing XCOM, 
95% might as well be the same as 0%. When we're to <laughs> exactly it. the same reason that Blood Bowl players swear this happens half the time. Okay, fantastic, yeah. yeah. Uh, it's worth noting that apparently the people who wrote the original rules for Blood Bowl played the computer game of Blood Bowl and started sending abusive messages to the develops- developers <laughs> because they swore to God they actually made this more likely. So Games Workshop, who I think have renamed themselves Warhammer or whatever the fuck, are rumoured to have a long history of producing biased dice. So that means... <laughs> that right? rules! <laughs> yeah, yeah. So <laughs> allegedly, whatever manufacturing process they use to produce the dice produces dice that, on average, give you more ones. Well, the specific allegation was that somebody on a forum rolled a bunch of the dice and noticed that they weren't performing, like literally made a shaker, rolled them, counted them up, and found that they were performing not like a a proper distribution. So not uniform is what I mean. So then he went and started cutting them in half in the same way and weighing them and found that there was like a predictable air bubble forming in the process that was apparently causing them to roll in in a berserk manner. Biased manner. This is literally what bias means. I would you like the word berserk because it implies the correct amount of violence, <laughs> both done to the player and deserving of whoever produced those dice. So it sounds like Games Workshop is like us. They're in a war against their listeners. <laughs> Games Workshop's relationship to their uh, customer base is, is definitely a fraught one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. I have one last example, uh, which is Exploding Die. Uh, also a product you can buy from Games Workshop. <laughs> and that's a joke. It's not... But so, legally speaking, you cannot buy dice that kill you from Games Workshop. Well, I mean, you could choke on them. That's right. But they do have a note that says that people under three or idiots should not uh, be purchasing those. <laughs> well, I mean, that doesn't stop your average Warhammer we'll player. <laughs> 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 so an exploding die is one where if you roll a particular value, you get to roll again and add the, the subsequent rolls. So you usually have one D N and re-roll and add on N. So we're going to look at this for a one D three. The usual notation is to put an exclamation mark after them to indicate that it explodes, which means that it re-rolls on a three. So the possible outcomes on the first roll are one, two, or three. Each of them, if we think of this as the possible outcomes from this first roll, has a probability a third. This is that uniform distribution. This is that (laughs) uniform distribution. Yeah, yeah, yeah. something. Yep. Good one. If you roll a three, you roll again. Are we doing that that they could they chain explode? Yes. So you can do this as many times as you roll. So theoretically, you can keep going. I don't know of a tabletop game that uh, doesn't cap it to no re-rolling a re-roll. Okay. I mean, I think it's Shadowrun they did that, and that's not an argument in (laughs) favour. Shadowrun is a terrible game system. If you cap at one re-roll, this is much simpler. If you don't cap at one re-roll, boy, does this get fun. Mm. Because the probability of re-rolling... Of getting each of these, right, is a third here. But if you multiply out, the probability of ending at this point is a third. The probability of ending at this point, which is the second one, well, it's a third for getting to three, and then it's another third here. So it's one on nine. You'll have another third here. Probability of getting there is one on 27. And then you'll get, oh god, one on 81, and so on, right? Mm-hmm. So what you wind up with is powers of a third up here. This is a very, very annoying distribution because it's not uniform anymore. Uh, in fact, the number of dice... Or the number chart for this one? Uh, no. Oh. Yeah, sorry. So the number of dice is what we call a geometric distribution. That means a shape. Close. Uh, which means that you have some number of trials until you see an outcome, right? So in this case, we have some number of rolls until you see a number that's not a three. Or some number of rolls if it's a 1d6 until you see it not a 6. Now the average uh, on this is actually 1 on the probability of uh, seeing the uh, 3. Hello, uh, Tess here doing an interruption again. This is actually not 1 on the probability of getting a 3, it's 1 on the probability of not getting a 3. So 1 on 2 thirds. Sorry about that. Right, so this is a 1 on a third, which is 3. Right. If you're Can rolling... you do that? Can you put a, a slash on top of the slash? Yes. It just gets very confusing. Ugh. Yeah. Alright, carry Sorry. on. Hmm. Equally confusing if, if you clone the guy from Guns N' Roses and then put one on, <laughs> on top of the other. Yeah, but that's harder to do, to be honest. I don't know. I would consider the act of cloning slash the guitarist yeah. slightly easier than trying to work out a fraction on top of a fraction. <laughs> I'm sure you would. 
So I actually sat down last <laughs> night at four o'clock in the fucking morning and worked out what the average of this would be, which... Rolling one exploding D3. Or one exploding DN. So this is one DN that explodes on the N, right? Uh-huh. And it can explode infinitely. This turns out to be... Oh, God. So um, this is sum from one to N. So you add up all of the numbers from one to N uh-huh. times... 1 on n minus 1. Uh, in mathematical notation, that looks like this. Uh, we'll use k. Okay, you know how I wanted to know what the notation was for a curse? Or we just found it. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the Greek letter sigma. Sigma dick. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> no, you're not. <laughs> well, that was a, like a pure reflex. Now you're getting it. <laughs> See, I half expected you to say that in Black Tick's voice. <laughs> No, we're not doing the goblin voice yet. We're waiting. We're waiting. <laughs> I mean, well, this is the last example, so you're running out of time. Well, we'll have to find another co- topic of conversation. Maybe for another episode. Okay, okay. There is a simple way of writing this, uh, because it turns out that if you do this, you add up all the numbers from 1 to n, this is actually equal to uh, n times n plus 1 on 2. It, it just works. I promise. It's simpler you, because there's I, no I Greek have to take letters. Your word for it. Yeah, it's simple <laughs> because there's no Greek in it, yeah. So that means all of this is actually equal to, uh, rather more simplified, n times n plus 1 on 2n minus 2. That's just what it winds up being. Oh, sure. You can, you can take my word for this, right? Okay, yeah, yep. definitely. So that means if you're looking at 1d3 explode, your average is, uh, well, 3 times 3 plus 1 on 2 times 3 minus 2, blah, 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 blah. What? You just put 3 in where the n goes. So 3 times 3 plus 1, so 12, over 6 minus 2, so 12 divided by 4? Which is um, 6, sorry, that's the wrong one. So 3 times 4 on 2 times 3 minus 2, which is indeed 12 on 4, right? which is 3. So the average of just 1d3 is 2. And I imagine this does weird things if you, like, put it on... If you put on x-axis with with n being size of die and y being average, does it, like, do a weird shape or does it just align? It would probably look like like this, right? Because um, as you increase the size of the die, the probability of it exploding decreases. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, like, um, I'll do this over here. So, uh, 1d6 exploding. Well, that becomes um, 6 times 6 plus 1 on 2 times 6 minus 2, which is 6 times 7 on 12 minus 2, which is 42 on 10, or 4.2. If you just look at 1d6, whoops, that's 1d6, not 1.6, the average of that is 3.5. Huh. So this is a change of 0.7. This is a change of 1. Uh-huh. So it's decreased the advantage. Because on a 1d6, you only have a sixth chance of actually having the die explode. Incredible. I realize this is how I left the last podcast episode as well. But you wrote 6 times 7. And I tried to think of that as well. It wasn't time. <laughs> True to what I said previously, this has prompted a, the need um, to shit. Yeah, a, a, a bowel response. So, but uh, kisses, lovely as always. Lovely to be, lovely to go. say again. I've been holding it for a while, but yeah, seeing the sight of six times seven is just irreversible. <laughs> <laughs> Well, but thank you so much for coming on, as ever. Um, and to the three people who listen to this, if you do listen to it. What's Benedetta? It's the best movie of 2022. Very good. Benna what? Benedetta. It's the Paul Verhoeven um, lesbian nun movie. Sick. It's all Italian, (laughs) but it is awesome. Fuck it. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) That sounds like a great time, actually. Yeah, yeah. Dean, we're watching a movie tonight. (laughs) (laughs) See you later. Have a good one.